Hello, and welcome to On the House, TSHAC's podcast on home ownership and housing industry issues. I'm Michael Wilt, TSHAC Senior Manager of External Relations. I am very excited about today's episode because we're going over a topic near and dear to my heart, and it's the intersection of design and affordability. We are joined by two distinguished architects, Eric Robinson and Kevin Diebler, who together co founded. Rody Architects in Boston in 2005. A little bit about our guest. Uh, Eric is from Virginia and studied at North Carolina State and also the University of Virginia. Before launching his professional career at Charles Rose Architects, racking up multiple awards on a number of projects across the country, from Del Rio, Texas, to Wyoming, to Martha's Vineyard. Kevin is from New Hampshire, also attended North Carolina State and then moved to Boston in 1996. And he held positions at several architectural firms where he worked on notable mixed use developments and high profile museums in the greater Boston area, among other projects as well. Welcome to our podcast, Eric and Kevin. Hello there. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you for having us. Uh, Thank you both, Eric and Kevin. It's an honor to have you here and I can't wait to dive into this topic. Those that know me well know that I am passionate about both the natural environment and the built environment, and I believe that there is inherent distinct beauty in both of them. And also, this is a little known secret, and uh, only people that know me really well know this, and and that's that I've always wanted to be an architect. Uh, I didn't realize that until, until my 30s, and maybe it's not too late. Maybe I can go back and pursue that, but I kind of like what I'm doing now. But I've always thought it, it must be very meaningful to put your imprint on a city skyline or a college campus or as an anchor of a town center or a mixed use project that must be so rewarding. But at the same time, it might be a little terrifying because I'm sure there's a lot of pressure to get it right. And I'm sure that if Boston is anything like Austin, where I live, you've got countless design critics who are always critiquing your work and nitpicking every last detail. Um, I'm gonna do a little quick little level setting and then we'll get straight into the questions. Uh, We'll have a little dialogue back and forth and we'll see how this conversation goes. I'm really excited about it, like I said. Um, This is our On the House House podcast uh, that we do about once a month. And we started out doing it primarily on home ownership topics and we continue to do that, but along the way, we started introducing our audience to other topics uh, in the housing industry on the multifamily and rental side, on the fair housing side, on the different types of, of homes that um, that aren't ne- necessarily your traditional home ownership model. So we've been exploring different topics and this would definitely fit in into that area. And, and also for you to, to get to know us a little bit more, we are a, a state housing finance entity. Texas is unique in that we have two of them. And we are a nonprofit one. We operate statewide. Um, We are a statewide nonprofit. We are not employees of the state. Most people know us uh, under our three main program areas, and that's build, buy, stay. We help developers build housing through our developer financing programs. We help people buy a house through down payment assistance and the mortgage credit certificate. And then we help people stay in their house through a number of different initiatives and and grant programs. Um, So, we're going to get right into the questions, and uh, I want to start with what people are probably most curious about when it comes to the correlation between quality design, aesthetically pleasing design, and affordability. And in most people, when they see a nice building or a nice house or a luxury apartment complex, they think that must be an expensive place to live. Uh, so just to get into this very basic question regarding design and affordability, how much do these, these quote unquote, high quality design features or any sort of uh, aesthetically pleasing design feature, how do those impact affordability? Um, Michael, this is Eric. Uh, Both Kevin and I are excited to be here. So thanks for having us. Um, I'm going to actually jump back in if it's okay and go go back to your original uh, kind of point of um, sort of being an architect and designing in your own neighborhood and community. And 
if, if that's okay. Because I think that's really um, <clears throat> the basics and the core of Rody Architects. So um, Kevin and I have a long personal relationship. We obviously went to school together, uh, ended up professionally back in Boston together and ended up moving to, um, I'll say a developing neighborhood in the city of Boston, uh, one of the big, the biggest neighborhood of Boston. So we're in Boston proper. And, you know, when we started Roadie Architects, we, we decided that we wanted to make our own neighborhood better, right? It was, it was almost started a little bit on a, on a selfish whim that we were in this great neighborhood, have access to the water, access to the main transit sort of line, but there was a lot of, of kind of community aspect lacking. And so we really set forth um, to uh, make our own sort of area better. And, and that's really where we cut our teeth. And we learned a ton about the community process, what the design process needs to look like to go out in the community, to talk about a vision for projects and for the community. Um, where it wasn't always well received and or understood or you know change is always fairly negatively uh, sort of responded to. So you know the early days of of Rody it was really built on a community process of listening, uh, trying to understand what the community wants, maybe not always agreeing, but sort of set forth a vision that we could stand behind um, and basically really deliver what we say we're going to deliver. And so. We currently and have probably worked on, I'll say 25 projects that are within five to 10 minute walking uh, radius of our houses. So we live still in the same neighborhood um, that we moved to both about 20 years ago. Um, we go and get coffee with our neighbors that we've battled with in community meetings the, you know, the night before and said, no, trust us, we have a vision for this. It's gonna be great. And you know that takes a lot of work and effort but it also helped shape how we think about the work and the projects. And that is really at the core of who we are as just guys that are doing this. Um, but we're also there to make sure that our projects enhance the quality of the neighborhood or the community that they're going into. And that's not always the case. And I think people don't always think like that, but that is really at the core of who Rody is and how we work. And Kevin and I ensure that that translates through our staff and our employees as we're working in now every neighborhood in the city of Boston. We're working in New Hampshire. We're working outside of Boston and New York and, and uh, um, other cities within the area and looking in places back in North Carolina. And so, so that message is, is sort of translating out as we start to discover new areas that, you know, um, to work in. So I just want to touch on that because I think that's really critical to who we are as a, as a firm. And yeah, I'll let Kevin jump in and talk a little bit about your initial question. Right. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I uh, likewise, I just really appreciate the opportunity here, uh, Michael. Um, I think your question was um, regarding design and affordability. Um, and I think that uh, as Eric kind of laid that out, um, we are um, really, I think, uh, focusing first on, on the, uh, the way that a building fits into its environment. Uh, I, I wonder in, in some ways um, that uh, aesthetics and things like that um, don't really matter at the end of the day. Um, they, it's, it's more about uh, making sure that something fits into its context and that it fits in its environment. It's designed in a way that it will be efficient and it will uh, be maintenance free along its lifetime, and that it can uh, do its job, you know, over the course of it of its lifetime. Uh, so I think that we really try to pay attention to things at the uh, at the very beginning that are inherent in in the way we we started practicing, the way we started actually learning about the practice at North Carolina uh, was through more of an environmental design lens and the uh, the building's orientation is extremely important and we know you, a lot of your listeners are in Texas and that that's a an extreme uh, your, your extremes are different than the extremes in Boston but there are ways now that we can study these things we can analyze them and I think that we really make sure that you know we understand the footing that the, the building is going into before we talk about things like 
um, you know, what, what the, what do the aesthetics, you know, amount to on, on a project? It's, it's really not, uh, that, that, uh, important to us. Uh, we love designing beautiful things and standing back and, and, and just being proud of, of them, of course, but there are so many factors that go into how a building performs that, that we focus on first, the uh, amount of daylight, the, the human comfort issues. Um, and, you know, so I, I think that's how we sort of approach things. Got it. I, I appreciate that answer, Kevin. I appreciate the context that you provided, Eric. Just to follow up on a little bit of what you were describing, Eric, let's say you're in one of these community meetings or you've got a community vision. Uh, maybe it's in a neighborhood that you live in or it's five, 10 minute walking radius. So it's a place you're intimately familiar with. And let's say the neighborhood says, look, we, we want a more inclusive community. We want a lot of different uh, housing product types to attract a, a diverse uh, people from all types of backgrounds in, 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 in all types of jobs at, at different pay scales that could live here. And we want, we, we believe that this community should be vibrant and, and part of that vibrancy is having, having just a diverse, inclusive community. But at the same time, the community's saying, we want this laundry list of amenities or features, et cetera, that are, that's gonna drive up the cost of this development overall. What sort of role do you play in, in, in those discussions? Do you, uh, do you push back and say, well, you know, if you want, if you want to see this in community, you know, it's, you might not be creating the community that you say you, you want to create. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it's a great question. And it, it, you just scripted out our, our basically every day because <laughs> we are in the community meetings and we are leading the charge on all of our projects I think because we have the ability to demonstrate to and speak, I guess, the language to the community members to make sure they understand the benefits of what we're, we're trying to do within the project. And I think we talk a lot about projects being good citizens um, within their context and being respectful of their context, as Kevin was saying. And, you know, it leads with listening, I'll be honest. And, and hearing what the community has to say. And that's crucial. We, we, we don't think it's like, oh my gosh, you gotta go to another community meeting and get our heads beaten in. That is not how we approach the work and the process. The city of Boston has a um, very rigorous process that's very inclusive. It's very public and um, it is required. And so we are out talking to the communities all the time and listening to what their concerns are. And, you know, a lot of it is making sure they understand what we're doing. We are not walking in and plopping a six story building in their residential community and say, take it or leave it, we're out. You know, we go in and talk about a process. We talk about it in a very linear way. We show graphics. We talk about it in a way that people can really understand it. So they might not agree with everything that we're proposing or talking about, but they certainly understand generally why we're doing it or what the reason behind. So they have a lot of um, concerns. They know their neighborhood pretty well. We know our neighborhood well, but we do go in and listen. So it's really about a dialogue and listening and strategizing about, you know, well, we're going to try to pull this back and create, you know, maybe less shadowing on the abutting building or whatever it might be, but it might be that we can't do as much green space on the street or set back here. So we really talk and strategize and sort of, let's say pro-con, but maybe pro-con in, in a simple way, the sort of elements of that we're proposing and what the benefits are and what the negatives are. We, we're, we're not, we're not trying to hide things. We want people to understand and feel included in the um, process and the dialogue. A lot of up here, especially, we see the same community members over and over again because they're active, right? So they're in their neighborhoods, making sure that what's going on is being respectful of the neighborhood. We respect that. We've been on the other side of the table. Like I said in the beginning, where we started, <laughs> we started in our own neighborhood because we wanted to make it better. We were on our own little planning um, board. And so we, we, we were on the other side of the table. And, you know, I think so much of it is just about ensuring a respectful dialogue and a process. And, and you know, we need to get to an agreement and a place of where we're um, maybe not in love with both sides of it, but we sort of understand the process. So 
it's so much about that part of it. Um, and look, Kevin's right. We're not so worried about what a window looks like or what a you know thing looks like until we get a project that we can all kind of stand behind and be like, this is going to be make this better, you know. And we've been in plenty of meetings where someone will be like, you know what? I love that rundown house with the wreck cars out back because it's quiet. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> and we're like, okay, we can appreciate that. So they're worried about change and things like. So we sort of you know think about it. We listen. We anticipate. We do a ton of design, you know, thinking in the, in the office. And we'll go back and talk to them about what our response is to hearing that kind of concern. And we might get it, we might not get it, but we'll, we'll have another meeting. It's fine. I mean, the number of breakfast meetings and coffee meetings and, you know, living room meetings we have, um, just to ensure that people understand it is pretty, we think it's pretty crucial to the getting the thing right and the process right. So, um, well, that's encouraging to hear. You, you don't have charrette fatigue at, at this no. point. <laughs> we actually thrive on it. It's kind of like the you know the 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 lifeblood of the yeah. firm is to sort of talk about this. Doesn't begin issues. until there's a charrette, and, <laughs> and uh, we we do sort of approach our communities in that way. Um, that they're part of the, the process, you know. So we, we talk a lot about the feedback you're getting from the neighborhood, from the community, et cetera, but we haven't really talked about what happens when you take this feedback to the client. Yep. And uh, and I assume that there might be some pushback on the client side, um, but uh, my assumption is that if you say, hey, just trust the process and we're gonna get to a vision we can all agree on at the end, what sort, what sort of feedback are you getting from on the client side? You know, it varies really. I think that we, tend to be sought out by good clients and the um the the sort of process to uh, get there has has you know has been a process it's been a long long time to be able to you know i would say select our clients as as much as they select us we we really want to make sure that folks understand our clients understand that it is a process it's yes you could call it give and take uh, but it's 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 just a matter of getting out there, having conversations, and thinking through it. I mean, I, the the time frame, at least for us, um, for predominantly Boston-based work, there's a lot of time that has to sort of expire and go through um, these these periods. So we have time to make adjustments to to start out one way you know, adjust and make revisions and, and get it to, to be in a point where uh, the neighborhood and the client feel like they're, they're in equilibrium. And that, you know, is, is also, it varies by client, it varies by neighborhood as well. And, and yeah, I know you, you may ask some questions later about policies, but the policies in, in, in a, where we do a lot of our work, and we know it's very different places like North Carolina and Texas, the permitting, the planning, focus on different things, but we know it in here where it's it's very, you know, stringent in, in Massachusetts. You have to meet with your community. You have to take feedback. The, uh, the, the feedback comes back to the planning agencies and the elected officials, and everybody knows it. Um, it. It's not that way in a lot of parts of the country, so things fly a lot faster in different areas of the country, and that's that's a whole different uh, ball game down there. Um, but we, we really, I think, make sure that we're, we're aligned with clients that like, you know, how we approach our projects. We make sure that we're not putting something out there that uh, has to be taken away later for some cost reasons. Very, very careful about that. And that's why we want to make sure that we understand how a client, uh, what, what aspects they, they want in their project and we try to make it work with the community, uh, listen to the community. How do they react to the aspect of a number of, of units coming into their, their neighborhood or their street? Or, um, so it really starts a conversation when, when, when the two parties engage with one another. And, and again, it's, it's client selection. We, we love it when our clients can actually get up and, and do the talking in a, in a, in a meeting and, and actually engage instead of putting us up uh, sort of as a, as a front in that aspect. It's, it's really about making sure that the stakeholders get a, get a voice in that. And 
and and you know we are we represent our clients' interests, so they they deserve a right to go up and and pr present and propose their project, and that's why I think it's strong when it comes from their voice. And they, if you're an affordable housing developer, good for you to uh, develop your voice of, of speaking and how and why you're doing something. And I think community members, you know, respect that a lot more uh, when they see the stakeholder, um, you know, putting their pitch out there. Absolutely. Uh, I realize I'm in Austin. We operate statewide in Texas. You all are in Boston, operate in the, in the Northeast. You're expanding your footprint. You both have roots in the mid-Atlantic. Mid but uh, what's common uh, among us across the country, rural, urban, suburban, across all typologies, all different size scale of communities is that these housing decisions or decisions about the built environment are ultimately all hyper-local. And um, whether they are policies, zoning ordinances, neighborhood meetings, community engagement, everything when it comes to housing is, is done on a very, very hyper-local level. And so I think a lot of what you're sharing um, will definitely resonate with people wherever they are practicing, wherever they live. And it makes a lot of sense, especially these days, because we're spending so much time at home. And if there is um, a proposed development, a proposed anything that is going to change your surroundings, then you're going to have a vested interest in that. And I think the, the, the way that you've explained how you take into account the feedback from the community is very valuable, especially because you all live it. Uh, if you're working on developments that are within a five or 10 minute walk of you, no, no less than 25, then, then you're going to live with the kind of change that you're working on. So I appreciate that you have that perspective as well. You're willing to, to say, hey, we, we, would, we would accept and welcome this type of, of change in our own neighborhood. And, and so I, I, I believe that that hopefully assages people's fears, um, at least you know, some of the communities you're working with. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, we have a saying and, you know, it's called building where we live. And, you know, that was where we started. And I think what we we just talk about is just what, you know, what does that mean? And it just means respecting the community that you're going into, no matter where it is. Right. And, you know, we do a lot of work on um, when we go into a new jurisdiction or a new city or a new town. We do a lot of work. We read up on what's going on. We want to know what the, you know, what the sort of uh, kind of area is about, what the sort of, you know, is going on. And we really kind of learn as much as we can. We don't become experts until we start to talk to the, the, the community at large. But we, we want to be able to at least be respectful as we walk into these communities. Um, and hopefully when they hear us talk about the work and the projects and the goals of the projects, and Kevin nailed it. I mean, our clients are the most important part of this in a lot of ways. And we have so many clients that we've grown up with over the years that trust us that we're going to, we have the best sort of, you know, kind of goals of their goals and our, and the neighborhood goals and the city goals. We are respecting those and listening to them and not just sort of like trying to plow things through a system because at least, especially in new England and Boston specific, like, that just doesn't work up here. And so, you know, you can, I mean, I believe, and I know Kevin does too, that the right process might even yield more density or more height or more sort of uh, kind of end results for our clients if we take it through the right process. You know, you can sort of do the quick jam and, and or listen, hear what people want to say, what do they want to be invested in, what do they respect? So it's a whole kind of, little bit of a different approach I think that we have found um, I guess a, maybe a niche I don't know but uh, a success that we we really rely on but we work on it a lot every day I mean that's what we do is sort of we manage our our relationships and our reputation um, and again not everything's perfect so we're not saying it's roses we've been in many 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 heated community meetings till 11 o'clock at night you know having screaming matches but it's all about just respecting the process and listening and going back and having a difference of opinion and then say, hey, we heard you. This is what we're thinking. What do you think about that? Boom. And then you have another dialogue. So I want to uh, you know, sort of, I guess, jump maybe back into the very first part of the question that you asked. Um, and I, I think it, it sort of it, it moved around, but you, you asked, what do people in, everywhere want, I guess, in our country? 
And I, I was thinking about that as I, I think as the, this this question moved around, um, but I think it, it's sort of what we're seeing and and what we see as as growing up and and moving, you know, buying our own homes and settling in a, in a community. I think, you know, seeing the housing crisis that we have and, and how we've gotten here um, and thinking about someone who's homeless, I think number one, people want safety. And I don't, I, I was trying to figure this out because the country is made up of so many different ages and genders and orientations and races and nationalities, original languages, et cetera. I, I think the main element is, is simply safety and that has to do with that's core to, to shelter. If you don't have shelter, you feel unsafe, you're unsettled. Um, and, and then I think you also have this challenge in the United States with independence and the sort of drive to success. And, and, and as, as uh, you, you work through your life, you're, you're, you're trying to become more and more independent. And this, this notion of home ownership looks different, I think, all over the country. But, um, and, and it varies. I mean, cultural factors come into it big time as, as, as far as like what you feel good in and, you know, amount of square feet you feel comfortable and want and desire as your place. Uh, so I think that, you know, I'm kind of, only one more thing is <laughs> making sure that you have some connection to nature and that you, your house, your home, your condo, your apartment um, allows you daylight, allows you, you know, comforts, um, but allows you to get in touch with um, the environment. Um, and so I, I, you know, had put some time into that while I was listening to you all speak. So um, I think safety is a big, big issue in, in America. I, I appreciate those comments. And, and, and what I appreciate the most is the intentionality behind them and understanding the motivations uh, for people and being uh, respectful of that, understanding what uh, their desires, their needs are, whether it's somebody who, who purely wants, who, who's, who purely is seeking safety or the comfort of a home if they're living on the streets or somebody that has never had a living environment that provides them access to green space or to nature or to natural light or to their environment, or even how intentional and thoughtful you are in the community deliberation process. So I, uh, I, I'm I very appreciative of everything you all do and the intentionality behind it and, and how you go about your practice. And um, it, it, to get back to, uh, to get back to, to how this opened as well, because we were talking about the intersection design and affordability, I wanna touch on that real quick before we talk about one of your uh, developments specifically. And it, 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 my my feeling is that whether it's somebody who's who's only looking for that safety in, 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 in their shelter, in basic shelter, or whether it's somebody who is looking for uh, their first starter home or somebody looking for luxury living with all the amenities you can imagine for not only them, but their pets and for everybody that's gonna visit them. Uh, in my, I, I, I would guess that you feel like regardless of who you're designing something for, whether they're just seeking shelter or luxury living, that you feel like everybody's entitled to quality design and, and, and quality, uh, quality housing in addition to, to just being affordable or safe or whatever. But with quality design can come some exp come expensive features. And so, um, you know, how, how are you still making sure that you can create um, an affordable place to live without, without sacrificing some design features? I'm, I'm ready because I, I sort of looked at that one and it made me really think pretty hard. I, I want to make sure that we level set a little bit because we don't look at design in a way of like, it's an extra layer. Um, and we certainly, we have a lot of industrial projects and usually the first question is like, why do I need an architect? But it's, uh, you know, and, and you, you quickly understand why, but we're trying to make that better too. But they, another podcast, I think the issue really is that design shouldn't have to cost more. And, and some of these basics that I touched on they do have to do with the environmental footing of a, of a, of a project. And 
to just purely think about something and, and use do an energy model, uh, understand that your windows of a certain size are going to bring in more heat or let out more, you know, uh, let out more heat, depending on what the climate that you're in. So we really make sure that we can um, solve those issues uh, fundamentally on, on a building and that it, you know, I want to say, does it matter about the materials that you use on the exterior? But certain fundamental things like the form and the shape of a building are, are really kind of zero cost issues. And if you can make a, a unit better and, and create a community out of these decisions that you make that are spatial, uh, that you can use all the tools that are available to us and with the technology that we use for, for modeling and, and, and visualizing and, and showing and sharing and talking. We, we really, you know, you know, in some sense, I, I really want to make sure that it's not, we want to correct this notion that design costs more, that architects being involved are all of a sudden going to add all this cost. We, we, we know enough about our clients and, and their, their performance and their finances that that just has to be solved. We, we have to build this in the most efficient way. And sometimes we're told that to do that. And it's, it's good when we can kind of, you know, get that right from the beginning. And we've, we've learned that. And like Eric said, we've just come to uh, find several clients that, that we really jive well with in, in terms of that, that mission. Um, so I guess I'm, maybe it's like a non-answer, but I, I <laughs> want to make sure that, you know, the, this notion that uh, design is not an extra added feature. Um, yeah. I mean, I think even to maybe try to think about it, even at least in my simple, I'm a simple brain guy a little bit, you know, all buildings have like fairly similar components, right? You have a wall and you have a window and a roof, right? And you got to build those things anyways to create the shelter and the things that you need. It's just, uh, if you can be creative and think about those things maybe a little bit differently or a little bit in, in a different way that you assemble those or how it's uh, sort of creating internal spaces differently, you know, it is a zero cost game because we still need to insulate the walls and do all the things no matter what the building looks like. Um, so I think it's just being a little bit more creative with the basic elements that we need anyways. Um, and then, you know, implementing those in, in, a, in a slightly different manner, maybe. And, you know, we, we do do some things in our buildings that we think are special, which we think a value of creating larger windows has a much larger return on its money and value for um, the, the residents and, you know, um, in terms of bringing in um, more natural light and having more connection to the outside. And so we certainly advocate for larger windows. And, and thinking about orientation a lot. Um, and, you know, you got to build a wall, you can put a window in it, or you can, and, you know, there's different ways to think about windows, right? You can do 10 smaller windows. Well, that's going to cost a heck of a lot more than a, one larger window. So think about it differently. And so I think there's just ways to, to kind of uh, skin the cat when you're starting to think about those kind of things as you get into more and more of the details. And I think we try really hard to use what we, we know we need anyways in, in maybe a little bit of a different way. Um, but I don't think that was non answer at all. I think that you hit the nail on the head. Um, in, in terms of, look, every building needs the roof, the walls, the windows. Every building is going to have a, a footprint. And depending on how you orient that building, depending on how you orient units within the building, space within the building, uh, the location of the windows, the size of the windows, all these different features are all zero cost considerations. But for a lot of people that don't practice it, I would say everybody that doesn't practice it, unless we've hired you, uh, it's 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 hard for most people to know. So uh, yeah, thanks for providing that explanation. Eric, I, I, you have more to say? No, 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 I think, nope, that's it. Okay. No, <laughs> of course we I mean, I have more, to, but like, obviously we can talk forever. So it's just- <laughs> that's, that's just a special one for us because I think, we, we really think a lot about it. And, and we, we've had to sit down at the table with builders and developers that, with looking at all the costs. And, and you, you are literally, where am I gonna get like a million out of this project? And you, you start to come to those realizations, like, well, 
You can't just eliminate windows. I know it's like a line item on the on the spreadsheet. You know, let us get rid of these things, or let's cut them in half, and and you just start to be like, well, okay, well, you cut them in half. You still got to put wall back inside that opening. You're just adding more cost over there. So it it, it becomes kind of comical in some ways. The the drive and and. You know, of course, we we value engineering as an actual design process. It, it's a part of it, but we we really do try to engineer it uh, in a meaningful way. So, thanks for that. Uh, it's kind of funny. The notion of just eliminating all the windows from your building. Yeah, I mean, you'd save some money for certain. You just yeah, every you every you know I like every unit would be empty because no like one would live there. So. What if we just drop the the height by a foot and take a layer of a foot yeah. out? And that, that usually makes the estimator kind of scratch his head a little bit like, all right, well, anyway. <laughs> uh, well, it, it, look, we're all on the same page about how um, we think no matter who you are, that you just, everybody deserves good design. And I want to talk about one of your developments that you worked on, 3368 Washington, which I believe is under construction. And once, it, once it's finished, will be Boston's largest permanent supportive housing community. Um, it, but before you, before we get into this community specifically, I should mention that here at TSHAC, we're expanding our role in the supportive housing space. Um, we actually host a supportive housing institute that's in its third year. Um, we work with the Corporation for Supportive Housing, a nationally recognized uh, entity, for, and they are the ones that provide that training. We've worked with 14 teams across the state to bring new supportive housing developments into their communities. And for some of them, it's the first time they've had a freestanding supportive housing development in their community. And we're talking about big cities like San Antonio and, and decent sized cities like Waco and Brownsville and, and other places that for the first time will have their own supportive housing communities. Um, I've taken a look at some of your work. Uh, I've taken a look at the 303068 Washington I'm blown away by some of the design around supportive housing developments these days, particularly the ones that you are, are working on. Um, so tell us about this, this community, 3368 Washington, uh, who's gonna live there and, and what stands out about it from a design standpoint, maybe what you all are most proud of. Sure, I can jump in and talk a little bit about that. So um, it is, um, it's 202 residential units. So it's going to be 140 supportive housing units and then 62 uh, low, moderate income uh, restricted residents. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a five story building. And, you know, it, it, it came to us um, in, in a, a, a great opportunity um, to work with, uh, it's, a, it's a partnership between Pine Street Inn, which is Boston's, I think, largest uh, homeless uh, advocacy group and, and sort of activists in sort of getting people off the streets. Um, they have a housing first program. So they're, they're you know, they're not, they, they don't worry about if you have addiction and sort of the, all the sort of negative aspects that usually come along with being homeless. Um, so their, their goal is to get everybody off the streets first. That's it. And then they have the support um, you know, mechanisms and, and processes to, to, to give these folks uh, the ability to be successful um, once they're housed. And then they team with the community builders, which is, you know, a national uh, affordable housing developer, um, and they came together. And so we really have a, a project that is housing two very different populations. Um, the supportive, supportive housing folks need a lot more services a lot more security issues around them and things like that. Um, and then they have, I guess I would say more, a more traditional uh, affordable housing component to it. And, you know, the process was our typical process. We, you know, we were hired to do this because of who we are, what we've done. We took it through our design process as if it was any other project. Um, just the supportive housing units are small. They're about the size of a hotel room, but they are fully, you know, they have full kitchen and, and bathrooms. And, um, and, and then, you know, we just went through our typical design process, our community process um, and ensure, you know, and, and we're out in the community explaining that this project will be, as I mentioned early, 
a good citizen to the community that we're we're building in. Um, and you know, that's really how we started it, and that's how we sort of took it through its process in a very successful way. Um, and you know, there was definitely some concern about housing 202 units in a single building. What would it be? What would it look like? All the things. And we said it's going to look like every other, you know, well, every other roadie design um, building. It's going to fit within the context. It's going to be a good neighbor. Um, it's going to, you know, create a great public space or a great public realm. And you know, it, it's going to be a positive impact on the on the community. And you know, that's a, a, one of those projects where we talk about, um, I'll say, free design, but free, you know, work. Where if you look at the actual floor plan of the building, it is. It's not probably what most people would expect. It's it's a shape that's a little bit odd, but the reason the shape was odd is odd because we were able to one fit more units on the site, which is important to this project, obviously, because everybody wants to provide as much affordable housing as possible. Two, we were able to create a um, private courtyard space for the support of housing residents that they could have an outdoor space that was protected and safe, as we've been talking about, within the context of or confines of the building, south facing courtyard, it's beautiful. Um, and then we were also able to then use the geometry to pull back on the street to create larger sidewalks and a, a relief on the street um, for the community at large in terms of the larger sidewalks. And so, so many of the things that we did on that project were within the earlier stages of how to mass out the building on the site and get the density that we needed um, to support the program of the clients and also um, obviously have the community uh, embrace the project moving forward. And then we, you know, then we did the things that we do always. We, we gave them larger windows to be, create more natural light and connection to the um, to nature around it, sort of in a kind of in a hill, um, and it has a lot of great trees around it. So we really wanted this kind of connective view from these sort of smaller units, but larger windows, so they feel not confined in a in a in a prison cell or anything, but connected to the community at large that they are now part of as a you know hopefully a successful resident um, in the city. So you know I think. Again, it, it's multifaceted. It's a project that's kind of unbelievable. It is under construction right now for us. Um, and it's, you know, it's moving along fairly well. It's a complex site, um, but it's, it's, it's going to be one that we're going to be so proud of, uh, you know, when we get on the other side in, in a year and a half. So um, it's amazing. Well, I can't wait to visit it next time I'm in Boston. Um, and in you really made me think about something I've never thought about before, and it must make your job really hard. And you have to think about the building as it interacts with with two different sets of, of people, right? How the building fits into the neighborhood and how it's interacting with its surroundings and making sure it's a good citizen building within that neighborhood, but then also how the building interacts with, with the residents that live there. And that's particularly important with supportive housing communities. And I've learned this through the Institute that we host with the architects that we bring in who instruct around trauma-informed design. They helped me and other people in that Institute realize that there are considerations that we don't think about that um, for, for residents of these communities, especially if they're coming directly off the street, like they will be at 3368 Washington. They have been exposed to things that are unimaginable, unfathomable to us while they're living on the streets. And there might be things whenever they move into permanent housing that, that trigger some of those past events, some of the past trauma that they've had to endure. And they might not be obvious, some of those features in a building, some of those design elements in a building, and, but they might be severe in their impact on a resident. And they're especially not obvious to people like us who haven't had to go through what they've gone through. So can you can you maybe talk, talk about that, how you incorporate the perspectives of, of those tenants into your design, especially if they're tenants like this who are moving from the streets into a unit? I, I, um, I would say that I saw that reference to trauma uh, design and some of your, your questions ahead of time. And I, I think that we we really try 
to understand this. And, and that's where the client comes into play. Pine Street Inn and the community builders, and, and especially Pine Street Inn, it's, it's about the, the caseworkers that are on hand too. And the physical aspects of a building, probably a lot of work has been put into that about how, how to do it and how big to make a lobby or you know those things. But Eric mentioned that the different you know uh, sort of populations that one building, each one will have management staff on site that are trained and qualified to, um, I guess, be on hand. I think one of the key aspects of living in, an, in a community of supportive housing is that it is a community and there, there's some leadership, there's some structure to it, which probably in and of itself is the trigger of like, here's, here's the landlord, that, that's where I got in trouble in the first place, or that's a negative stigma to me, that this idea that I have to be accountable to somebody. They are very sensitive about that. And, and what we know about other successful uh, developers around the country is that over time, they, they build an expertise on, on, on bringing the this, uh, individuals through a transition where they're going to be okay uh, in this new community and to feel comfortable, to feel safe. I, I think it, it does start with the staff on hand and um, do they have the right kind of facility to do their work? You know, are there offices? Are there places? Or is there a front desk? Is there something where it is accessible? I think we've we've seen some really interesting things in uh, uh, Maryland, uh, Bethesda area about uh, community living and uh, just to sort of uh, eventually the community starts to support itself uh, in this. But right off the bat, there is a, a, a very difficult transition that I think people face. And, and um, you know, yes, I, I think that Eric and I are fortunate to not have had this experience of homelessness, but we see the people that are treating the, the, the population and, and the kind of work that they do. It's really, um, you know, grassroots and, and, and uh, pretty amazing what, what they do in these, in these facilities. Thank you both for that, for expanding on that. Um, turning to a different topic, but one that we mentioned earlier, and that's the housing crisis that's affecting us, whether you're in the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, whether you're in some high cost metro areas in Texas, like Austin or Midland, Dallas, El Paso, Houston, everybody's experiencing these tremendous cost pressures on both the home ownership side in the in the rental side, and as as design professionals, I realize that you all aren't often asked to to weigh in on this crisis. But I'd like for you to give us your thoughts on on our current housing affordability crisis and what role you think the design community should play in addressing it. <laughs> I think, I That's think, a small uh, one to ask. <laughs> Are we going to have to flip coin? No, nope. to do this? No. We could both talk about it. Huh. I, I, you know, it, it, we are doing all sorts of housing right now, but it, it goes from condominium developments to even some single family uh, net zero, you know, structures or apartment buildings, high rises, mid rises. It, the, the demand is what's creating it, number one, the, the, uh, these projects that, that we undertake. But you know, looking out around the country, traveling, you start to see new buildings popping up. You see places like Raleigh-Durham that are exploding and that, that are just really you know, moving. Um, and the, the, the thing that's sort of happening is that it's sort of hard, harder to find land there's continual population growth. There's economic growth in different areas that are kind of asymmetric to where wealth is. So you, I think, just really need to, you know, I think uh, the housing crisis is a, a factor of just um, we're, we're not building dense enough in certain areas that we can build dense. And the, the spread and the difficulty to, um, you know, find new land and find uh, reasonably priced housing is getting harder and harder. Um, so um, the, you know, th this, I guess, impending recession or, or adjustment period that we're, we're in right now is going to, you know, 
point to, well, there's going to be less housing started. It's costlier. It's this, it's that. The demand is just continuing to rise. And factors leading to homelessness are on the rise. And, um, you know, in Boston, there's a big issue with opioid addiction and it's, it's wrecking lives. And, um, you know, so all of these are, are factors that are creating demand uh, for housing um, and, and for housing, um, you know, individuals with, with difficulties uh, economically. Yeah, I mean, I think that, <laughs> I mean, I think there's there's certainly what we see in up here is, you know, I think there's we need some policy reforms um, on helping move things forward, and I think we are seeing some, which is kind of awesome. And you know, we we just took um, a project through Cambridge, uh, which is. Um, well, is the first project that uh, to be approved under their new affordable housing overlay for the whole city of Cambridge. So um, if the project met certain requirements, which was affordability, basically, um, and then sustainability aspects, you were able to, to um, basically still have to go through the, the, the planning board process and the process of it, but it actually could not be, I guess, stopped. Um, it, as long as it met the criteria, you still went through, we went through, we heard the comments, we heard the neighborhoods, you know, we did all the, the, the sort of same steps, but it was more as an advisory because we were meeting the requirements of the new housing overlay. Somerville is uh, uh, launching the same, a similar one. So creating more certainty and uh, better uh, paths for affordable housing, um, I think is probably something that's, you know, badly needed. And I think, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, and it's one of those things that, you know, it's complex. I'm not trying to simplify it, but, you know, just providing a plot of land that's 45 minutes outside the city that has no access to trains or connection doesn't help, right? I mean, that maybe it helps on some level, but you know, we're, we're so used to being close to transit and, you know, and those are all costs that have to be factored in to um, future housing and, and connectivity and affordable housing. And, you know, one of our, one, one of the clients that we took it, uh, took the project through with, um, it's called Just to Start, they're sort of a, um, an affordable housing developer here, but their mission is affordable housing along with sustainability and not like, sort of, you know, simple stuff like passive house, like real sustainability. And their, their thought is, and they're thinking about it is that the affordable housing crisis is, is, a, is, a, is a sort of broader piece. That's, it's, it's one thing to build and provide people some housing, but if it's not efficient, then they have massive, you know, heating bills. And if they have, uh, or if they're not close enough to mass transit, then they might have to have car and car insurance, which is, so they look at the overall sort of I guess, you know, um, cost to live, living cost, and factor that into how they think about their projects. And, you know, I think that's just like such an awesome way to think about it and, you know, to give people the ability to be successful in what we would say is well-designed, you know, sustainable um, buildings that um, sort of, they can see how this is gonna work. So, I mean, I think there's so many different facets to it. And you know the the funding mechanisms and things are are very complex. We're not sort of on the front front of that too much, but we are definitely part of that. Um, so I'm sure there's some you know policy aspects of kind of committing resources and and sort of moving things forward that will help. Um, and I think you know I I think in what we saw through Cambridge is they still held us to the highest design caliber as well right so it, for us it was a perfect match and to be the first you know first project ever to go through this um for the city of cambridge was again pretty inspiring and you know the comments we heard were amazing and the, the discussion was awesome because it was it was almost we were the test test you know test run of this um new policy and there was some concern and there was no doubt that people would they would get a lesser design product because you could almost sidestep all these other aspects of it. And, you know, we even heard at our final, you know, uh, hearing was like, well, you know, this project proved it that we can do it and uh, deliver good design 
um, and affordability. And so, again, going back to sort of how we're thinking about our work and our projects, um, it's it's it just seems to work how we're thinking it it should work in a lot of ways. So that's that's kind of pretty much unbelievable and inspiring. So um, we're happy to be part of this if we can help in any way. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm go, I'm glad that you pointed to a specific policy um, that just drives home the point that there are policies that you that communities can put into place that will create more affordable housing opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have existed. And it's not through any deployment of bond money or a lot of capital. It's just to a change to your land development code. Yeah. And I think it take, you know, and again, I mean, it was successful because I believe the client and, uh, you know, we have the same kind of ideals and goals, right? So it does take everybody to sort of make sure it's, it's working. But I think in, the, in this case, it, 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 it did. And I think you're right. I think it's, um, you know, the city of Boston is starting to implement some reduced parking ratios and some other things that will help. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think there's more that can be done um, in terms of that aspect of it to help kind of, you know, and I mean, Boston's and just everybody probably knows, well, maybe not you guys don't, but, you know, in sore need of updated zoning. I mean, we're just, we're, we're sitting on very antiquated zoning, which is, is very difficult, with, you know, and, and no doubt, but I think providing um, some avenues that can help move things along um, that are uh, that we need to do um, faster, I think is, is something that can be done in a fairly quick order as I as we've seen in Cambridge and in Somerville. So yeah, it's funny. I, I was I was delivering some remarks in Columbus, Ohio earlier this year, and I was bemoaning the fact that Austin hadn't updated our land development code since 1984. Come to find out that Columbus hasn't updated their land development code in like 70 years. And so, I mean, it's it's kind of shocking how some of these cities, population a million plus, are sitting on antiquated land development codes. Yeah. But going back to what uh, Cambridge and, and now Somerville are doing with their affordable housing overlay, they'll say, look, we'll, we'll waive kind of this onerous process that you typically would have to go through in exchange for providing X percentage of affordable ho housing units on site, also assuming you meet our sustainability goals. You get kind of the green light to move forward. We did something similar in Austin. We called it affordability unlocked. If you dedicate half your units, rental or home ownership, um, to to them being affordable, then they're going to waive certain site development restrictions like compatibility and parking and FAR and things like that. So, in, in, in what was interesting, especially from the nonprofit housing world and the nonprofit development world is I, we were all curious, are market rate developers going to buy into this? Are they going to subscribe to a program like this? And we were blown away by the number of market rate developers that are participating in affordability unlocked. And we were also kind of surprised at what little neighborhood opposition there were to these uh, developments that are being proposed, because you're going to have a more intense building right next to you. You may have a more congested uh, 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 streets with, with parking, but the community was saying, hey, look, We'll deal with some of these trade-offs if you can bring people close, bring people back into the city, workforce people that make this city run, that can actually live in here and aren't, aren't commuting 45 minutes away. And they're willing to live with the trade-offs and the developers are willing to do it um, because it, it, everybody has the shared goal of affordability at the end of the day. What we were lacking were the policy vessels to implement um, this sort of shared vision for affordability. So I'm encouraged and what Cambridge is doing, what Somerville is doing, and it sounds like other communities are adopting. That doesn't it doesn't cost the community a thing. It's just some tweaks to your to uh, to your development code or to your zoning or to whatever to entice this, this type of development that can drive costs down. Yeah, so and I, I, I think it. Yeah, and then I'll as I'll, it puts. I think it puts more onus on the designers and the design team to create good projects, even if they maybe have. A little bit of the sort of restrictions taken off them right we still need to do the things that we do on a daily basis at least that's how we feel you know you got to still think about it as a good citizen building going into a community you still want to do those things at least we believe you should so just the fact that you know some of those constraints have been released still i think puts the onus on us as designers to ensure that we're doing good projects for the community. And I think, again, we still had to go through the community process and meet and talk and explain it all. Um, but 
you know, I think, so it's that balance and, and I think you're right. And, and I think we we're both hopeful that, you know, this will start to kind of take off and more and more and, um, you know, seeing more market rate developers join into this, I think it makes some sense. And I think as the economy starts to constrict and, and maybe there's more funding available for it, we will see some of these developers take, uh, you know, take a look at this. And, and I think that's awesome. And that's, that's what we, we need to be doing. And, and, you know, we're, we're hopeful that that'll start to take foothold and, and move things for, uh, along further too. So. That's great. A couple last questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. And um, they're both kind of on this policy side of things. And one of the things you mentioned was about how expensive land is getting, we're experiencing that everywhere. And so we all know in, in the housing world that the way you, you can reduce the costs per unit, whenever you're dealing with some expensive places to build because of land or whatever is to introduce density, but there's still a lot of resistance to density. We, we all kind of know it's how you make the numbers work. The more units you can pit per acre or half acre or quarter of acre, the, that's the way you're gonna be able to accomplish some um, cost savings, whether you're in a condo regime or whether you're developing apartments or whatever, when, it, when you're out in the community and having these conversations with neighbors and you're introducing some level of density that might be uncomfortable to residents, are, are you still getting a lot of resistance to density in general? Yeah, I think it just comes in, in all sorts of different, you know, forms. I, you know, it, it, it may have been, may have changed a little bit with, but, in, in Boston, we've we've had a building boom that has, you know, I guess in some way, um, has started right around when we um, started the firm 15 or 17 years ago. It was it was really start it, it really just sort of has taken off and it it hasn't looked back really. Um, but I think the, the the communities in some manner are were getting more used to to projects and proposals and seeing that benefits come with them. Like new restaurants are taking over a, a caved-in hole in the in this in the city or in your village or neighborhood. A new building takes care of the derelict property and and adds something. And you know, it, it's always a debate about parking and tra transportation. And in, in denser locations, you can start to find ways around that. Um, but but really, uh, the communities. Um, have both been more accepting, but now certain areas they're 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 seeing too much of an influx. They're seeing a, a change in their character. Um, however, I, I also feel like they may be the places that were very restrictive to density. Um, so even the incremental gains in density um, have all of a sudden changed the economic nature of who's coming to move into a neighborhood. Well, there's not enough housing to support them. So the price per unit for a desirable neighborhood is going up. Um, and I don't think that anybody has seen a decrease in their property value or that 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 is not necessarily happening, even if there's dense building happening around you. It's it's really something where, you know, we, we hear just about everything out of out of community members mouths that, um, you know, you can't react to you just have to listen and um, and it's it's just um, occasionally there's some venting at the, at the meetings about what the, what they think density will bring, but it's it's been a long time since this this sort of building boom that we've we've seen happen. I know it's happening all over the country as well, but good things can come along with them, and we we really want to make sure that that there is that sort of give and take in this in this process. It's not just a take only. Uh, Got it. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, just to touch back on, um, we, we talked about the affordability overlay, we talked about affordability, affordability unlocked here closer to home. Are there any other policies you've seen across the country, maybe maybe locally or across the country that you think have been effective in, in, in bringing down the cost of housing, uh, whether it's changes to regulation, zoning, land, land use policies, development codes, et cetera? Can I say no? <laughs> <laughs> and you can say no. I just, I'm, I, I, I mean, I hoping. think like, well, I, I, I guess, I, guess I, 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 maybe I don't know. And maybe Kevin does. Or what would you I, like I, to see? 
Well, I mean, I, I think, well, I guess for us, sustainability is a, is a, is a real, you know, issue. And obviously, I mean, at least I, you know, and I think buildings are obviously, you know, energy monsters and they just are by the nature of them. And so I think that, um, you know, they're, they're seeing, you know, we're seeing the, our like base energy code and base requirements of, of, you know, they're, they're moving up, right. The requirement is moving up. We're getting more and more like, you know, it's almost like if we're not doing passive house and uh, lead platinum, we're, we're, you're almost not doing anything. Right. So I think that um, at least what that's what we're seeing. And, you know, we have a huge resiliency issue up here with uh, flooding and, and, you know, so there are a lot of pressures on our buildings and our projects now that aren't, you know, they weren't really as prevalent 10 years ago, even 15 years ago on ensuring that the new future housing is, is really sustainable and meeting energy codes and, and sort of, you know, doing better. And so I think there's real cost in that. Um, there's no doubt, you know, we see it in, in our performance and our numbers, but I also think it's the right thing to do. So I think if we can, you know, I would love to see more policies and, and, and sort of, you know, to bring more funding to these projects to help them, you know, meet the sustainability goals that we should be meeting um, while providing some more, you know, sort of density and the different aspects of it that do start to offset some of the cost of land and things. So, I, you know, it's a, it's a multi thing. Um, and, you know, the city of Boston has a very, very, you know, uh, a strong target for, you know, carbon neutral uh, soon. And, you know, we're, 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 we're really confronted with this on every single project we're dealing with. And, you know, every project um, is going all electric. We're doing, you know, it's just, it's, it's now how we do it. And I just, I, I want to make sure, I guess, that that's not sort of stifling some of the development um, because it's the right thing we should be doing. And, you know, and we believe that as a firm, we believed it from our freshman year in college when, as Kevin mentioned, we got environmental des design degrees that, you know, we're all about kind of the free sustainable aspect back in the day where you how which way you face your windows and sort of that, that kind of sighting of things. And, you know, don't cut that tree down, put your house over there and different things like that, right? So um, now it's so much more complex. I mean, it's so much more complex in terms of the envelopes of our buildings and, and sort of the, the different, you know, systems and how we do it. But it, it, it is starting to create buildings that um, are better, uh, you know, for the environment and kind of, you know, hopefully kind of sort of staving off some of this as much as we can. And, um, so I think, I, I you know, I'd love to see, more funding um, to help with sustainability approach and affordability approach. I mean, uh, and I don't know if there's a policy yeah, out I, there or not. I just I think, I think so that's where we should be pushing, you know, policies at least. Um, yes, yeah. so. they're they're not really widely known, but I, I I think that there's there's a lot out there, like tax credits and and creative ways to um, spur um, you know industries around doing certain things. Um, land acquisition costs could be deferred through some tax credits uh, if you're doing something and you're turning something into a nonprofit. Um, it's, it's out there. It just it does take a little bit of expertise in aligning yourself with a few consultants that understand how to do this. And um, so um, it, it is a different kind of a world to, to develop affordable housing. Um, but we, we've, we've really seen some amazing people that are, are working in the industry. And that, that's usually the source of a lot of our, our contacts and referrals um, to clients. Got it. Well, look, I appreciate you both being on here and your time and your expertise and uh, your comments really resonated with me. And I know that they'll resonate with many of our audience members. Um, so just thank you once again. I, this has been a very enlightening discussion, especially for a design nerd like myself, a self-proclaimed design nerd. Um, or is it a geek? I, it, I'm a nerd and a geek when it comes to design. Just give me all types of design everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I just want to say thank you both so much for your time. Um, give you both real quick any, any chance to say some final comments and then we'll sign off. No, I mean, I, maybe, maybe I would. Okay, we'll always say something to end it. But you know, I think uh, we appreciate you inviting us, and uh, 
you know, I think we, we, we believe in, in the missions that we're trying to do. And we do believe, you know, design is transformational um, in, its, in, in just its bare essence. And so I think it's a powerful tool um, and we take it seriously. And I think that, um, we, you know, we think that it, it is the way to, to think about the, the projects in the build environment moving forward. So we, we like talking about it. Hopefully that was, <laughs> it was clear um, because it's exciting. And, and I think, you know, our office staff and the people that we work with are amazing. And, you know, the, the younger generation is also unbelievable. And, you know, it's really at the heart of um, sort of, pushing us forward and pushing our projects forward. And we, we really, we really enjoy it and love it. And I think um, thanks for letting us share a little yeah. bit with your. your yeah, and, and again, I really appreciate this, Michael. You, you have a, an interesting background and uh, really um, kind of cool that we were talking about places like Cambridge and Somerville and, and you're in Texas. And uh, yeah. it just tells you that it's a, it's kind of a very important issue and it's, it spans a lot of distance and territory. And, and I hope you're, listeners enjoyed what yeah, listening to what we we had to say and uh we, we'd love to see everybody down in texas sometime uh barbecue is really good down there we're excited about that yep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both uh that was kevin diebler and eric robinson with roadie architects in boston again this is michael wilt with texas state affordable housing corporation with another episode of on the house thank you michael